But what I'll talk about today is, is what I've done during my, my PhD at Aarhus University. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, what I'll talk about today uh, is work I did together with Professor Alexander Selikin in the Medicinal Polymer Chemistry Lab. And um, I'll talk a bit about self-emulative linkers and polymers that we use to transfer chemical information. And, um, and that, uh, so we stay a bit within uh, this field of uh, artificial bi biology that we just started. So I think this fit quite well. Um, so the field that we uh, have focused on within uh, mimicking biology is where we zoom in on the process of signal, signal transduction. And signal transduction is the way that the cells uh, adapt to the surrounding environment uh, by having these transmembrane receptors that can then respond to incoming uh, signaling uh, from a signal mo molecule, uh, which can make a conformational change in a receptor. And this causes then a, a cascade of these uh, intercellular signaling proteins that activates, deactivates, which in the end will do also something in the cell. It can be the structure movement, cell death, um, by uh, altering the activity of the effector proteins. And what we've uh, been fascinated is, with is specifically to zoom in on this receptor and see, can we actually mimic this and transfer chemical signal uh, or chemical information across the membrane? And then we also looked into these, um, I'll just, um, and then we we'll also zoom in on this communication between two proteins and see if we also can use chemistry to uh, induce this uh, communication. Uh, so first I'll start with uh, the receptor. Uh, all right, uh, ah, yeah. So um, the chemistry that we use to do this is something called self emulation and this uh, specifically uh, can be um, these self emulative linkers. And how it works is that you have a linker that is connected to a trigger and an output. And in itself, it's stable. But if we apply an external uh, stimulus, uh, we can remove this trigger. So it can either be in somatic cleavage or um, chemical uh, cleavage or, or a physical stimulus. Uh, and the point is, when the trigger is removed, we have an unstable compound that will spontaneously degrade into a release of an output. And this process is particularly used in product therapy to what, where this would then be an active drug you can release. There's another concept uh, similar, but here with polymers instead. And it's the same, these self multiple polymers, um, they just consist of many of these self multiple linkers. So when we apply the external stimulus, it will be a spontaneous depolymerization uh, into a release. And this is the chemistry we want to use to mimic some of these uh, cellular processes. Uh, processes. Um, first, I'll start with a system we developed uh, that we call enzyme activating receptor. And here we use this self emulation to try and communicate a signal across a cellular membrane. So we designed this bionic receptor that we could look, uh, put into the membrane. Uh, and then applying an external stimulus would then activate this receptor that releases a secondary messenger. And this secondary messenger was then able to activate an inactive so, uh, enzyme, so a cymogen, into an active enzyme. And this process we could then monitor. Um, we specifically chose uh, the enzyme papain, which is a cysteine protease um, that can be blocked by a, a disulfide and then be reactivated by um, releasing a free thiol in the active site. Um, and over here is the chemical structure of this receptor design. So we chose glucuronic acid as a hydrophilic uh, trigger, which can be cleaved by piece of glucuronidase. Then we have the self molten linker here, which connect um, a lipid, lipid anchor, which ensures that we can have this receptor in the membrane. Then we have a um, effector molecule that is here cysteine, so it's a natural compound. And then when we have this um, self emulation process, we release cysteine and cysteine has this style that can then be internalized and thereby activate papain. So this is the intention behind this artificial uh, system. First of all, we had to synthesize this uh, compound 
And it was a, an 11 step synthesis starting from protected chlorinic acid. Um, I'll not go into details with it, uh, but uh, we managed to isolate the wanted compound, um, which was, uh, was very nice. And we could use this for our experiments. The first thing we wanted to uh, investigate was, could we actually state, see that this receptor was membrane localized? Um, so what we did was we used this uh, malamide that is fluorescent, so the malamide could um, in situ react with the receptor and thereby uh, make it fluorescent. So here we see uh, GOVs uh, and then we did confocal uh, microscopy to, to see the fluorescence. And what you see in the first two are the controls where we only have the receptor present or only have the malamide present and we can see there's no fluorescence. However, if, if we both have the receptor present and the malamide, we can clearly see how we have these nice spherical um, fluorescence appearing uh, co-localized with the lipid bilayer membrane. So we do indeed have this uh, membrane localized. Uh, another interesting thing is if we add beta glucuronidase, so the activator that starts this self emulation process to release cysteine, we can see that this fluorescence disappears because we release cysteine in this process. So this was very nice. So we could continue to actually test this system um, if our concept worked. So um, we apply, we developed a liposome model system where we could encapsulate the cymogen, so the in inactive papain, together with the substrate for papain. Um, and then we could apply the receptor. Uh, and um, if the receptor was just present without the activator, you can see over here, it's the fluorescence intensity. Uh, we see no increase in fluorescence intensity. Or if, if we apply beta glucuronidase uh, externally, we clearly see an increase in fluorescence, which indicating that our receptor system work and we can activate papain and thereby convert the substrate into the fluorescent substrate. So this uh, confirmed our hypothesis that we could use this to transfer information across the lipid bilayer. Um, we also did this um, on, like analyze this with microscopy, so we can actually see it on the liposome level, these nice uh, fluorescent dots appearing uh, corresponding to the liposomes. So it's happening within the west vessel, this um, in, within the liposome. So this proved that we could actually have a biological stimulus that had, uh, activated this chemical uh, signal construction me mechanism in the form of self emulation resulting in a biological relevant output. And specifically this with having a biological output is um, very nice because this is some of the things that people have been struggling with in literature to design these artificial system where it actually also have biological relevance. Um, to take this even further within applying this in, in, in uh, bio, uh, in biology, we wanted to introduce it into cells. And to do that, we uh, made a new design of a receptor that we call apoptosis inducing receptor. And what we did here was that we used the same core design. The only thing we changed was the, um, the effector molecule, where we here chose MMAE, which is a highly potent toxin. So the concept would be the same that we externally could activate this mechanism of signal transduction release um, the effect to the interior and here the intracellular effect would then be cell death. We um, tested this in uh, 3D spheroids and um, what we did was we had, had the cell and then apply the receptor to have these uh, receptor engineered cells. Then we could grow them into 3D spheroids um, and when there were no activator present these were stable and alive. And then when uh, we could apply beta chloronidase externally uh, to then induce this cell death. And here are the results. So what you see here is uh, some different concentrations of the receptor. And in the off state, we can see that the cells are still green, so they are alive. So when we don't activate the system, it's stable. However, when we then activate it and treat it with beta chloronidase, even down to the lowest concentration, we see very clear cell death. So the system does indeed work as a kill switch. We can activate the system uh, on demand. 
Um, another interesting thing was that we also tested how far after we could activate the receptor. And here we showed that even after five days, we could still reach the, uh, reach the receptor by treating it with beta coronidase and thereby uh, induce the cell death. And this is very um, impressive uh, membrane persistency uh, compared to what you otherwise see in literature. So we believe this system actually had very good potential um, as uh, application, for instance, in cell-based uh, therapies. Um, this work we just got uh, accepted in advanced science, so it's in the press at the moment. Yes, so this was a receptor mimicry. Um, and now I'll go into something else where we then use uh, cell multipolymers instead of linkers. And the intention behind this is that instead of mimicking a receptor, we wanted to see if we could transfer chemical information between two different enzymes in solution. Um, and the intention was that we again used papain as an inactive cymogen that we could then conjugate to the polymer. And this polymer would extend out in solution and thereby capable of interacting with another macromolecule, which could activate the enzyme. However, if we didn't have the polymer in the active site, there would be too much steric, so these two could simply not interact and would not see this activation. So this was the aim of, of this uh, project. And the polymer we used for this was based on lipoic acid, as shown here, which is a natural uh, occurring compound. And um, you can polymerize this by ring opening polymerization. Um, and we found that you could use a, a variety of different dial traps to end cap these polymers um, and thereby also control the size of the polymers. Um, so there's an example over here with NMR where you can see uh, here we have added a, a high concentration of the end cap. So we basically don't get a polymer, it's, it's a, a dimer. But then by decreasing the thiol trapping, we could increase the degree of polymerization of these polymers so we could have a very nice control. We could also analyze this with, uh, with GBC where we also had uh, good or decent dispersities. Um, this polymer um, uh, is a polydisulfide. So, uh, which means that of course, if we treat it with an excess of a reducing agent, we would expect basically all disulfides to be degraded is, um, and thereby the polymer would fall apart. If this was the case where we had this main chain session, the major product would thereby be the reduced form of lipoic acid. However, we believe that this polymer could actually have some interesting properties and actually be able to degrade by self immolation. And what I mean with that is that we could treat it with only one molecule of DDT per polymer chain, which means it will only degrade one disulfide, but it instead induces this ring closing mechanism uh, of degradation, self immolation, um, and thereby we would see the major product instead being the oxidized form of lipoic acid. Um, we uh, analyze this uh, using HPLC as shown here. And here's the reference of the oxidized mon monomer and here's uh, the reduced monomer. And as expected, when we treat it with the excess amount of DTT, we have the main chain session. So we see that the major uh, degradation product is indeed the reduced form. However, interesting, interestingly, um, when we treat it with this one equivalent of DTT, the major product instead becomes oxidized form, uh, indicating that we do indeed have this self emulation mechanism of this polymer. And this in, in itself makes this polymer uh, very interesting because it means you need very little signal to actually fully degrade it. Um, it's, this polymer is based on a natural uh, compound, making it highly relevant in, in bio applications. And, um, at the same time, this process happens within minutes. So this is fully degraded basically as soon as you can transfer your sample into an HPLC vial and start this run. So it's an extremely fast process. Um, and we therefore think this type of self multi uh, polymer in itself is very interesting and also superior to many uh, of the existing self multi polymers. So what we specifically wanted to use this for was to prepare this chemical cymogen. 
so we took Popeye with the style and then uh, we reacted it with this type of chain transfer mechanism where it basically can react to any data file in the polymer and attach one end of the polymer while the other will fall apart through cell stimulation. And this type of chain transfer mechanism is quite unique um, and normally not something you see with synthetic polymers, but only uh, mechanisms in nature. Um, but yeah, we could prepare this conjugate. We could uh, analyze the conjugate using uh, GPC, and we could also analyze it using uh, isoelectric focusing, which I think is quite nice because here papain is, has a very high PI, so it barely enters the gel. And then when we um, conjugate, we add a lot of negative charge, uh, shown here that the cymogen uh, has a, a lower PI. So it was very nice we could prepare the cymogen, but we of course needed to see if we could also reactivate the cymogen or did we even uh, inhibit the enzymatic activity. And this is what you see here. So here we have the enzymatic output. And here we just show the activity, like the substrate in itself, showing that it's not for non-fluorescent on its own. Here we have papain on itself. And here we see that papain without any thiol present is already active and it doesn't change anything to treat it with GHA. However, when we prepared our cymogen, we can see that without GSA present, we have actually inhibited the activity, which is very nice. And uh, most importantly, when we treat it with ethyl, we can regain this activity. So our polymer uh, papain conjugate actually works as a cymogen. Then to our specific um, intention. So we wanted to see if this polymer uh, conjugate would be superior to the having the serolink cymogen, so without the polymer to extend out in the solution. Here we started using um, the protein activator at BSA because it's well known to have an exposed style. And the result is shown down here. So in blue, we have the serial length, and here it's very clear we have a very low increase in enzymatic output. However, with the self emulsive antenna, we see this clear increase um, in enzymatic activity, indicating that this system does not work and we can use this self emulsive polymer to induce this transfer of chemical information uh, between the two proteins. So this was really exciting and we wanted to see if we could push it even further and um, take it to um, a variety of different proteins. So we also introduced here a new type of cymogen here where it was conjugated to PEC instead. So here we expected it to basically completely block any type of interaction with another macromolecule. And then we of course still have the serolength cymogen and the papa and polylipoic acid uh, conjugate. And um, here we started of course with the positive control where we can see that a small molecule DCT can activate all of them. Then our negative control was a lysozyme, which doesn't have any thiols, and here it remains flat, so there's no activity as expected. Then we tested different uh, proteins, so there are different kinases, um, uh, for instance, and what we see very clearly is there's a trend that the red line, which corresponds to um, the PAPA and PLA um, cymogen, in all cases except for the last one, is superior to the other cymogens. So it doesn't does really seem like we need this self emulsive antenna to be able to induce this communication between the two proteins. Um, the last one is uh, transglutaminase, uh, and here they actually have the same activity, the zero length and and the polymer, um, and this can be explained by the fact that it has a lot of exposed style uh, transglutaminase and also very high uh, redox potential. Um, so it was expected this was the case. So in all with this uh, project, we could show that we can indeed make these, um, these uh, induce this protein-protein communication between uh, uh, yeah, communication between two proteins using uh, this self emulsive polymer. Yes, um, here in the end, I am gonna talk shortly about uh, something completely different and has nothing to do with uh, self multipolymers, but instead it has something to do with all our uh, life at the moment because of the corona pandemic. And uh, when this 
corona pandemic started last year, um, we got together with a big group of collaborators to simply establish a project, can we fight this? And um, the background for this is that we continue and keep having uh, pandemics in the world. So it's, it's not first time uh, with coronavirus. We also had Spanish flu, HIV, Ebola, Zika virus. And um, this is uh, also something that we can expect will also continue happening in the future. And the problem with viruses is that normally you have the one box, one drug approach when you want to treat it, which means when we have new viruses appearing, we can't do anything about it. We need to first develop a treatment. Um, and here polymers becomes interesting because um, polymers can actually interact non-specifically with, with viruses, meaning that they have potential to actually work overall spectrum in, um, in this. Um, so what you see here on the cover is a polymer and a virus particle, and it can it make these um, non-specific interaction here with the virus particle and thereby inhibit the cell entry. And uh, another good thing about polymers is compared to other treatments, it's cheap and it's also stable to have polymers for treatment. So um, we picked up this uh, to see if we could um, do something. Uh, because previously in our lab, we have worked uh, a lot with creating these broad spectrum antiviral treatments. So you can see here it's um, papers that we published uh, several years ago by now. And back then it was when the Zika virus was uh, appearing. Uh, and what we did was we created this big polymer library with anionic polymers. And the reason for this is that the capsid of, of a virus is usually positively charged. So here we can have the, uh, so here we have the anionic charge to interact. Um, and what became evident with this was when we then, with our collaborators, screened it against a variety of viruses, is that this combination of charge and the correct hydrophobicity was an important uh, part. And we actually found hits that, uh, or leads that had a broad uh, activity against many different viruses. And here I'll just uh, show the results from specifically the Zika virus um, performed by our, uh, our collaborators from Ulm University, Jan and Franci. And uh, what you see here is these are three different uh, yep. polymers. And um, when we have here the uninfected cells, um, it, yeah. Here are the uninfected cells. And the green part here is then the Zika infection um, shown by green fluorescence. When we then treat it with the polymer in all three cases, we actually decrease this uh, virus infection. So it actually shows a great promise. So this was where we picked it up uh, when the corona pandemic then started and was maybe some of these polymers can actually be used to create this broad spectrum uh, therapy. Um, another thing that polymers was that we also introduced using uh, gold nanoparticles. So here we took the gold nanoparticles and coated it with these polymers. And the reason for this is particularly for administration purposes, because we intended that to go for these respiratory viruses so we could administer through nasal or through inhalation. Um, and thereby these nanoparticles might uh, help for it to reach the target site. Um, and what you see here is um, different sized nanoparticles uh, coated with the polymer and show here that they are very nicely dispersed. We uh, first started testing this uh, with our collaborators on the RSV virus um, and not SARS, uh, simply because this is a very well-established uh, model also in mice. And what we see here is that in birth with the polymer alone, but also the nanoparticles, in all cases, we can uh, decrease the uh, RSV positive cells. So this looks very nice. We could then next go into mice experiment uh, again with the RSV virus um, as a very good model. And here we can see uh, the mice with the infection, and then we treat it with either the polymer or the uh, nanoparticle coated with the polymer. And in all cases, we see a clear decrease in, um, in infection here, or, or here it's quantified specifically for the lungs, 
where we have a significant decrease in all cases. So this actually really seems to work that this polymer can inhibit this uh, RSV infection. Um, I can't, unfortunately, not show you results yet for um, the corona, specifically the SAR virus. Um, but these are the next experiments that we're starting at the moment uh, to see if we can actually use these polymers and these also gold nanoparticle polymers as a more broad spectrum uh, treatment against these um, respiratory viruses. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to see uh, see the results when, when uh, these, uh, these experiments are finished. So here and then, I would of course like to, to thank uh, my uh, Professor Alexander Selkin, my supervisor during my, my PhD for uh, being a great supervisor. And, uh, um, and then of course, uh, I would like to thank our collaborators, uh, particularly from Ulm University, Jan and Franci for doing all the viral work and also the, the whole uh, collaboration with fighting coronavirus. Um, then for the MPCL group members, I would like to specifically thank uh, Peta, Aine, Shalisa, Livia, and Camila, who all uh, contributed to some of the results that I've shown today, but uh, also the rest of the group for creating a fantastic working environment and, uh, and uh, great science. Um, I'll of course also like to thank the funding that makes this research possible and, and thanks to all of you for listening today. Okay, thank you very much. There's a few questions in the chat. First two questions are from Rui Amir. Uh, many thanks, very interesting talk. And the first question, did you check if quinone method uh, that, uh, that is being released show any toxicity by itself as it may interact with nucleophiles inside mm -hmm. the cells? Uh, well, it's it's a good question because it's a common uh, um, like it is yeah the kinomethide would be released at first before it, it can react for instance with water um, like we've not done it ourselves but my guess would be so since this type of cell mold linker actually already exists on the market for product therapy my guess would be that it's not toxicity that would be a problem um, yeah but we didn't test it ourselves specifically. Okay, thank you. And the second question is quite long, so you, you'd better have a look at uh, the chat, but I will read it. In, in the SIP, uh, on each monomer, there is primary and secondary tire ether that upon reduction with DTT, transfer into primary or secondary tile, which need to attack the tire ether at the other side on the monomer. Would the rate of cyclization depends on the type of tile that is being released? Okay, I'll just read it again, I think. Yeah. Okay, um, well, uh, <laughs> That is a very good question. Uh, my guess is, yeah, it might affect it. Um, but since this process in itself is so fast already, I'm not entirely sure like how you would uh, how you'd monitor it uh, already, uh, because it happens within full degradation happens within five minutes. Um, so it's an effect that doesn't really, I guess, make a difference in in the big picture because it's fast either way. Um, but it's a good question, yeah, actually, how, how you would measure it, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a better answer than that. <laughs> Thank you. And next question is from Umberto Capasso Palmiero. A uh, very nice talk. I just have curiosity. Why these polymers are called self-emolative? What is the difference between common degradable polymers? It's actually the same question I have. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a good question. Maybe I was probably not clear. So I think the, the difference is that you need a specific stimulus. So this is otherwise stable, but you need a specific reaction to happen for it to start degrading. And then when that one specific uh, like triggering event happens, the full polymer fall, falls apart. Where if you look at normally like biodegradable polymers, for instance, esters, 
And then it's each bond that you need to cleave. And here we state we actually only need to cleave one bond and then the rest of the polymer will fall apart. That's what makes it self-multive. Okay, because what I didn't get in the beginning of the talk, how the trigger keeps uh, the polymer non-degradable before it... Well, yeah, so in this situation, it's, well, because it's disulfide, it is also like, it depends, of course, which, uh, which uh, environment it's in. Otherwise, you, it, it could, of course, uh, start reducing. But the point is, it needs a di like a thiol to start degrading. And then it fully degrades with one thiol. That is what differs it from, from just degradable polymers. Okay, thank you. And um, another question from Shiki Wong. Uh, interesting talk. I have a question related to the second messenger molecule in the first part of the talk. Did it transport to cell via active uptake or by passive transport? Did it transport both inside and outside the cell membrane? Um, so is it specifically to um, the the is it to this system or is it to the one we actually took into cell experiments? Do you, I don't know if it's possible to clarify. Um, so specifically for, I can also just explain. So specifically for, for this system, um, we actually tested using only the cysteine molecule in itself. I didn't show the results, but we compared these two um, and also used um, so first of all, the receptor is uh, outcompete completely cysteine. So cysteine can pass the membrane. Uh, so if you just treat with cysteine, we will not see activation of the cymogen. And second, if um, we also did an inhibitor experiment where we added an inhibitor um, that reacts with dials externally, and here um, the receptor still performed, but cysteine did. Um, so here we're trying to actually prove that cysteine sits in here and is released to the interior and not to the outside and diffuse in. We have proved that, yes. I just don't have the results here. I tried to simplify it. 